Hello, this is Kyle, also known as Alien Tude, and today I am reviewing this Albion Next Generation Vassal. This sword is on loan to me by my friend Brian, who acquired it secondhand. I want to say a huge thank you to Brian for loaning me both this vassal and the chieftain I reviewed two weeks ago. Thanks, Brian. It's greatly appreciated. Now, this vassal retails new for $1,518 in its default configuration, and the blue grip adds an additional $30. This is after Albion's recent 15% price increase. Before that, it would have been $13.20 for the sword and then another $25 for the blue grip. I'm going to point out right now and then just not really mention it again that this sword has a little bit of patina and flaws in the finish out near the tip. When I pointed them out to Brian, he said he would go ahead and clean them up when it gets back to him with probably a gray scotch bright pad and some oil or CLP, something like that. That's what Albion recommends for cleaning up uh, flaws in the finish. Falchions are one of the most misunderstood weapons from the medieval time, in my opinion. There's this sense in the modern zeitgeist that they are kind of a blend between a sword and an axe. And that's just not right. You know, a falchion is a sword. It is balanced like a sword. It is not at all balanced like an axe. If you look at an axe, you know, all the weight is right out here at the end, at, at the business end, and almost no weight towards the hilt or anything like that. There's not even really a hilt, it's just a haft. But all the weight is concentrated out near the cutting part. And that's not the case on a sword. On this falchion, the majority of the weight, especially when you look at the length of the blade compared to the hilt, is in the hilt. Down at the actual cutting portion, there's not a lot of weight there. And part of that misconception is that falchions were anti-armor weapons, which is just no. They are not chopping weapons. They are not anti-armor weapons. They are cut-focused and slice-focused, but cutting and slicing against armor is a fool's game, at least metal armor. Against textile, yes, they're actually pretty well optimized for cutting textile armor, but anything metal, uh, mail, plate, anything like that, a falchion's going to be all but ineffective because it's just not designed to go against that kind of target. You know, if you look at historical falchions, a lot of them, you know, there's not a lot of them. There's not a lot of artifact falchions that we have and that can look at, but the ones that we do, a lot of them are highly decorated. And that to me says that they were likely the weapons of nobility. And I would guess, this is my thought process here, but my guess is that they kept them as an anti-lower class uh, weapon. You know, to be, a weapon to be used against the peasants that could not afford strong metal armor, couldn't afford mail, couldn't afford any kind of plate added to on top of anything. They had at best, you know, textile armor, gambesons, arming jacks, that kind of thing. And while those are surprisingly resistant to cutting if you don't have a sharp sword, once the sword is very sharp, they provide very little protection. And a falchion is very well designed to have a very sharp edge that can cut through textile armor and obviously the flesh underneath. Now the vassal in particular is representative of an Elmsley type F3B falchion. And those were generally characterized by a mostly straight spine. This has a little bit of a flare to it, but it is mostly straight. A gently curved edge, a fuller that runs most of the length right up until the spine starts tapering in to make it a much thinner, and a clip point that, relatively speaking, over the course of the entire blade is not particularly long. Now, this is a pretty long one for a type F3B, but it's not as long as a F3C, which that's the primary difference between an F3B and an F3C, is the clip point length, and then also the broadness of the blade. Uh, F3Bs are generally going to be a broader blade than uh, 3C. Now, the vessel is pretty clearly heavily inspired by the famous Thorpe falchion that is at the Castle Norwich Museum. It's not an exact rep reproduction. It is its own design, but you can see a lot of similarities. 
the cross guard is very similar to the Thorpe, although it has uh, clover cutouts rather than the quatrefoil. It's also a little bit more upswept than the Thorpe is. And the Thorpe has is more of a F3C. It's a little bit uh, narrower of a blade. The clip point is longer. But one of the most interesting things to me about the Thorpe is the fullers because they're asymmetrical. On the Thorpe, this long fuller is only on this side of the blade and the short fuller is only on the other side of the blade. I'm not really sure what the point of having asymmetrical fullers on the Thorpe was, but it's possible that it, they were purely decorative and just wanted something that looks cool. The fashions of the Type 3 group started to appear around the 1290s, so very late 13th century, and over the course of several decades into the 1350s, the tip and the clip point started elongating more and more. The cross guard on here is what I would consider an Oakshot Type 6, uh, maybe a little bit more upswept than your typical Type 6. The cutouts here are kind of a clover shape, and they are much more well-defined and evenly done than you would see on anything historically. Take a look at the Thorpe Falchion in comparison. Those are wildly asymmetrical compared to these. This is much more of a modern look than you would have got historically. But at the same time, that's done because Albion wants to appeal to the modern buyer, not to the historic buyer. The finish on here is a satin that's pretty typical for Albion's hilt furniture, although because it's, generally speaking, a pretty flat surface, there's not a lot of contouring and angles to it. It has less grind lines than you'll typically see on the more complex cross guards that Albion does make. That's not to say this is a plain cross guard or simple. It has some geometry to it. You know, it starts thicker, here at the center and tapers out towards the tips of the quillins. The gap in the cross guard is there and maybe a little bit bigger than you would typically see on an Albion. And, and that's kind of because this is an odd shape. The falchion has a slight ricasso right here, making the general shape of it a trapezoid. And the cross guard, the gap in the cross guard mirrors that to a degree. It is trapezoidal, not rectangular. But right here at the edge, it's still a little bit bigger than you would typically see on an Albion. We're talking less than a millimeter here. It's still very well done. It's just something that is a little bit less perfect than you'll typically see on an Albion. The grip is dyed this absolutely beautiful shade of dark blue. I love this color. It's right up my alley and it looks just really nice and really pretty. The shape of the grip is really well done. It starts wider than it is thick and it tapers in width towards the pommel, but it also swells up in thickness just a little bit right here in the center before again gently tapering towards the pommel. It's a really effective shape for locking the hand in place and having a good idea of where the sword is and giving you good feedback for edge alignment. There's also five evenly spaced risers that are very well done, and they also help keep the, the grip locked in, in your hand. It's just a very effectively designed grip. As always for Albion's, the transitions from the grip to the pommel and the cross guard are just absolutely perfect. This is something that I've said before, I've said, I'll say it again, Albion does these transitions better than just about anybody, any major manufacturer I see. And the seam here is, there, it's not really, it's not noticeable by touch at all. I can see it if I look for it, but it's very well done. The pommel is an Oakshot Type I, and it's pretty big and chonky. And that's a good thing because it does a really good job counterbalancing the sword overall. There's a lot of dimension to it also. If you look here, not only does the center part, I'm not sure exactly what to call it, but not only does this part right here kind of taper towards the peen, but so does the overall, the center boss here that tapers towards the peen as well. Hopefully you can see that. This is a really well-designed pommel. All the corners are chamfered nicely as you would expect. Although I will say if I'm gripping it just a little bit lower on the sword, 
the center boss can kind of interfere with my grip just a little bit. And I can fix that just by gripping up a little bit more. And it's very comfortable at that point. Now the finish on here is more typical of Albion than the cross guard in that it's a satin and it looks nice, but there are definitely more grind lines noticeable on it than on the cross guard, especially on the boss faces, which is kind of surprising to me because that's the flattest part of the pommel. You would think that would be the easiest part to grind smooth, but what do I know? Now there are two flaws on this pommel that I did notice and they are very, very minor, but I did notice them, so I'm going to point them out. I want to reiterate, these are minor flaws that I really only noticed when I was inspecting my video and close-up photography. First off, there's a very slight wobble in one of the corners right here. If you could see that on the with, without me pointing it out and just by looking at it, kudos to you, because I certainly didn't notice it until I inspected my video. The other thing is that the area around the peen looks a little sloppily done. It's finished a little oddly. It's not polished clean as much as you would normally see on an Albion. Again, this is not a functional problem. These are aesthetic flaws. And I honestly, I hesitate to even use the word flaw because it implies that it's wrong or it's bad. And this is just things in the finish that are not quite up to Albion's normal standards. They're purely aesthetics. And whether that bothers you or not, that is up to you. I'm pointing them out here because I noticed them, but especially the finish on the pommel towards the peen, that one I think could have been cleaned up a bit more. And now it's time to talk about the business end, the blade. As always, here's my measurements. As is fairly typical for falchions, this is a somewhat short blade at just over 27 inches long. It starts out pretty wide at over one and a half inches and flares out to a big belly that is close to two and a quarters inches. Now I didn't measure the blade percussion node as while it does flex a bit, it's very stiff as you can see here. The thickness starts at 5.4 millimeters and drops all the way to four millimeters after only three inches, after which it slows dramatically down, barely tapering much at all to the spot where the spine transitions from thick to thin, and it eventually gets down to about 1.8 millimeters, 24 inches up the blade. Now there's a lot going on with this blade's geometry. You've got dual fullers, a large clip point, that thinning of the spine right here, which after that, there's actually a little ridge that's about a quarter inch or so from the edge of the, from the false edge. At least right here, it gets a little bit closer up in the clip point. And this transition here and geometry reminds me a lot of an Anakubi Zukuri katana. The finish on this sword is very typical for your Albion with a even and nice looking satin that still has some grind lines visible. When you're looking at these close-ups, you will probably notice a lot more grind lines in the false edge. That's not from Albion. When Brian got it, he felt that the false edge was too thick. He wanted it sharp. It's not sharp. It's not not sharp, but it's not sharp. I wouldn't call it unsharpened, but I wouldn't also call it sharp. But anyways, he definitely worked at that false edge a decent amount and brought it up to closer to sharp. In sharp. But it's he also left a good amount of grind lines there. This would be could be cleaned up with some work going in with a finer and finer grits of sandpaper and eventually smooth it all out. And while I'm on the subject, Brian also resharpened the edge with a work sharp. So you're going to see a small secondary bevel there, but it's pretty small and pretty well done. The tip here is formed very well and very aggressively. This is a very acute point and should make for a pretty effective thruster. However, it's also quite thin up here it's not a robust tip. So I think if you were thrusting against particularly hard targets, I could see this take deflecting a little bit or taking a little bit of damage because it's not a robust tip. It's not like a 15A sword or anything that's dedicated thruster. It will certainly penetrate a soft target, no problem. But a harder target, I probably wouldn't want to thrust with it. The fullers are ground in very, very well. They terminate at 
nearly the exact same spot on both sides. There's a tiny difference, but we're talking half a millimeter, maybe even less. No big deal at all. Looking down the planes of the blade, there are pretty much no ripples at all, except in that false edge where I see a little bit of a trace of a rippling. Honestly, I'm not sure this might have been caused by the extra sharpening because Brian said he did have to do uh, a bit more grinding on it to get it to where he wanted it to be than just a simple resharpen. Now putting aside the secondary bevels that are a result of the additional sharpening, the beveling here is outstanding, as always for Albion, really. It's one smooth bevel from the thickest part of the blade to the edge, and very smooth and evenly done. This is absolutely what you expect from an Albion, though. Let's test the edge on some paper to get an idea of how sharp this is so that we have more context during the cutting. Just a reminder, this has been sharpened by Brian, so it is not representative of what you would get from Albion. That was one of the easiest cuts I've done on this, since doing this test. Very clean, very smooth, basically no effort at all. Let's try a test that I pretty much never do because I suck at it and it's very hard for a sword that is not extremely sharp to do. So, yeah, this sword is very, very sharp. Let's take a look at some cutting footage, starting with water bottles. This sword cuts water bottles quite well, as you would expect for a falchion with extra sharpening. The lighter targets, it glides through very easily. I was able to get a few silent cuts here and there, but not quite as many as I expected to. You know, I have high expectations for falchions with the sterling armory and Angus trim falchions I own being two of the best cutters I've ever used. And this one, fell short of that a little bit. That's not to say it's bad, that's just that it's going up against incredibly stiff competition. Against bigger or tougher targets, this sword fares quite well. It's able to get all the way through bigger, thicker targets, provided my edge alignment is on. On this horizontal cut on a two liter, it was off and it just bounced off. The sword just bounced off the bottle because my edge alignment failed. I tried it on a small Gatorade bottle, which is very thick and tough plastic, and it made it all the way through. On a lighter target like this paper container, it wasn't able to cut when I came in from the side, probably edge alignment, but when I did a straight downward cut, it cut deeply into it, which is something, I've only really tested this with one other sword, it was a katana that was sharp enough, and it failed to do this completely. So. Results inconclusive because I don't have enough testing done with it, but this seemed like a good result. And a few other random notes. I did a armored milk jug with a t-shirt over it. This time, instead of putting the milk jug inside the t-shirt, I just kind of draped the t-shirt over the milk jug. This means that there's two layers of fabric before I get to the jug. And my edge alignment was off a little bit on this cut. It still got into through the, the cloth and into the jug, but it didn't do a great cut because my edge alignment was off. And then on this milk jug, when I tried to do a double cut, I did, but in the middle of cutting it, I just completely twisted the sword straight down into my stand. And that poor stand is getting so beat up. The sword handled it no problem. It didn't take any damage or dulling from hitting the stand like that. So moving on to pool noodles, this sword is clearly sharp enough to cut pool noodles. I'm able to get a decent number of clean cuts with it, but I also just struggled to get a lot of clean cuts. I struggled on anything other than just uh, overhand cut from the right to the left. My most, the cut I do the most, the one I'm most familiar with. The rest of them, I was able to get a few cuts here and there. A lot of the time I would get it 75 to 90% of the way through the noodle and then it would just go flying but it's clearly sharp enough to pop the pool noodle apart. So that tells me I'm failing it. In the hands of a more competent cutter, this would slice through pool noodles like they aren't even there. For Tatami, this sword cut exactly as I expected it to. That is to say, when my edge alignment and targeting were on point, it cut through the Tatami like it wasn't even there. If my edge alignment was a little off or targeting was a little off, 
it would usually either get all the way through with just less clean of a cut, or it would cut deeply into the tatami and then send it flying. And of course, if my edge alignment was just completely off, it just sent the tatami flying anyways. So yeah, exactly how I expected it to cut. And when the edge alignment was on point, when I got good cuts, it was a lot of fun. It sliced right through. I didn't feel any resistance. When I thrust here, it did get all the way through. There was about a third of an inch or so sticking out the other side. These horizontal cuts, I'm terrible at them. And at this point, the tatami was pretty compromised. So not surprising it didn't work very well here. Let's talk about the handling of the vessel. It weighs in at just over two pounds, seven ounces, and is balanced a few inches from the hilt. That looks to me three and a half, right around there. I haven't done measurements on this, so I don't have the precise number. But this is a, a, a sword that has a good amount of blade presence because two and a half pounds approximately, relatively short blade. There's relatively wide blade too. There's quite a bit of weight up here and not particularly far out from the hilt. And the pommel is pretty chunky here in a good way because it's helping to bring the balance of the sword where it should be. So it has blade presence. There's, yeah, definitely feel that blade presence. But it, the tip is not dragging me, you know, with the way the, with the false, the clip point here, there's not a ton of weight out here, that's for sure. The weight is more here and especially here because right here it narrows dramatically in the, the spine making the the last, that looks like about two-fifths of the sword, very thin and very lightweight there which just makes this a very nimble sword. I can move it around very easily with very little effort. The tip I can put pretty much where I want to without very much effort at all. It, yeah, it moves around very, very well, and the tip moves very well as, as well. And if we look at how the sword flexes, it definitely has some flex to it. Not a ton, you know, single-edged swords usually have considerably less flex than double-edged swords, but most of the flex starts right where that the spine starts narrowing, which makes a lot of sense. You want the blade to be stiff in the in the the strong of the blade, the lower half of the blade, because that keeps it, keeps the percussion nodes in the right spot. I don't know how well you're going to be able to see the percussion nodes, because again, this is a very stiff blade, but again, right around here, right where you want to be cutting, and by the way, also where the blade is pretty much just about the widest it can be, which helps with the edge angle for the making better cuts. So the vassal does generate some sword wind. I'll try to capture it here, but if not, uh, I'll get a different video capturing it. So let's see if I can get it to generate any. It generates a little bit of sword wind, not a lot. It's there, but it's a pretty quiet sword, but it is very maneuverable. I can move this around very easily. I can very quickly change direction or continue with another cut. All right, let's talk about comparisons. I have here the Vassal, and here is a Sterling Armory falchion that I've already reviewed. This one weighs around two pounds, 10 ounces, around two pounds, seven ounces, so a three ounce difference. We look at the blades, they are very, very similar. The Sterling Armory is a little bit less wide, maybe a little bit shorter. And that's interesting because it is a little bit heavier, which to me says that this probably has starts thicker. And yeah, if I'm just looking at it, the Sterling Armory definitely has a thicker spine and where they both, they both have that spot where the spine narrows dramatically. But the Sterling Armory stays thicker up to that spot, the vassal has a little bit more distal taper at that point. And then once they narrow dramatically, they both get very, very thin. So let's look at the balance point of this, the Sterling Armory. 
It's a little bit further out than the vassal, not a lot, but that's probably due to the fact that where it's getting narrow here on the spine, it's a little bit thicker here than the vassal is. But this one has a little bit more blade presence, a little bit more authority in the cut, not a lot. We're not talking big differences here. These two swords are actually very, very similar. I will say the pommel on the sterling armory I like better because it rests against my hand a little bit better. The vessel has that big boss rising out of the pommel, whereas this one is very smooth there. So this rotates in my hand a little bit better because the pommel kind of, let me see if I can show, kind of slides around my palm a little bit easier. Very, very minor differences here. But yeah, this has a little bit more blade presence, about the same tip control, maybe a little bit less, but we're not talking very much at all. And yeah, so I pick up the Vassal right afterwards. I do definitely immediately feel a, it's a little bit lighter of a sword and just a little bit less blade presence. And for my next comparison, here we have the Vassal. Here we have the Albion Sovereign. Now bear with me on why I chose this. I didn't, I do have another falchion I could have compared it to, which is an Ingus Trim one, but it's a discontinued model. So I don't think there's very many of them out there. And it's not something that you can really get, have an idea of how it feels in comparison. So the Sovereign is something that you could buy if you wanted to. And the blade lengths are pretty similar actually. Now, the Sovereign is 2 pounds, 12 ounces, 2 pounds, 7 ounces. So there's a good 5 ounce difference between the two, and they are very noticeable. When I move the Sovereign out there, it has more weight to it overall. I don't think it has any more blade presence. In fact, I think it actually has a little bit less blade presence. It is balanced. It looks like it's around 3.5 to 4 inches, right around there. But it feels like a little bit more of a cut focus than the falchion, actually. Uh, the tip, I have good tip control of it, but it's a little bit heavier out here than the vassal is. And it feels like it has just a bit more authority in the cut as well, which is kind of funny when you think about it because the vassal as a falchion is primarily a cut focus sword. Now it does have a wicked enough tip to be able to thrust, but the Sovereign as a Type 14 is very much a blended cut and thrust style sword, but this one definitely feels a bit more of a chopper than a slicer or a quick and nimble sword. And that's partly because the Sovereign is a pretty beefy sword. It's very, very wide here, stays wide for a large part of the blade. This is not a light and nimble sword. It just, it has a lot of authority in the cut. And it definitely feels like it is a lot more chop focused. I mean, that's not to say it can't be maneuvered. It certainly can, but it's going to wear you out quicker because it's just overall heavier. Bottom line, this sword retails for $1,548 in its current configuration. Is it worth that price? I'm going to get this right out of the way up front. No, but there are a lot of caveats to that. So bear with me here. Incidentally, I am absolutely stealing the concept of clipping a microphone to a dagger. Thanks, Daniel Green, fellow YouTuber. So this is the first Albion sword that I have said I don't think is worth it. Why is that? Well, first off, the price increase is most definitely playing a part here. Before that price increase, this sword was around $200 cheaper, and that makes a difference. But the other thing is I'm kind of spoiled for choice when it comes to falchions right now. I have here two of my absolute favorite falchions I've ever handled, two of my favorite swords I've ever handled with the Sterling Armory falchion and this Angus Trim falchion. Both of them are cheaper than the Vassal. The Sterling Armory, I think, would have... I, I bought this secondhand from a friend, and he ended actually traded for it originally. So I don't know the exact price, probably around $900 to $1,000, maybe a little bit more now after inflation. The Atrium Falchion, 
this specific model isn't really being made anymore, but Gus does still make falchions for around 1200 I think is what I've seen recently. So you can get outstanding falchions for around $1,000 to $1,200. The vassal is three to $500 more than that. That's a hefty ask to add that much extra price for Albion's typical fit, finish, and look when Sterling Armory and Angus Trim have excellent fit and finish and excellent looks, in my opinion. Now, I am not saying that the Vassal is not a good sword. It is a good sword. It's an excellent sword. The thing is, it's going against two swords that I think are superb. These are two of my best cutting swords ever. And while the Vassal is a good cutting sword, it, in my hands at least, it did not perform as well as either of my other two falchions, and it's more expensive. I don't think if you were to buy the Vassal at its current price that you would be disappointed. However, I wouldn't pay that price for it. I would rather get something from Chris Fields of Sterling Armory. He makes falchions fairly regularly. I would rather get a falchion from Angus Trim. He makes them fairly regularly. You'll definitely see them, a few of them per year at least. So it's not that the Vassal is a bad sword. It's not. It's a very good sword. The problem is that the price, especially with the price increase recently, it's not a cheap sword. $1,548 is a lot of money. It's a tall ask. And for me personally, I wouldn't pay that price for this sword. And the last bit I'll note is that when I have previously said I didn't think Al an Albion was worth it for me, it was because I didn't want that sword type. That sword type didn't quite fit me. Well, here that's not the case. I love falchions. Falchions are some of my favorite swords. They are right up my alley. They are my jam. So for me to say it's not worth the price, that to me is not saying that it's not worth the price because I don't want the sword type. I love the sword type. It's just not quite it doesn't quite justify the price compared to what else is available, in my opinion, of course. Just my opinion. That's why you're watching this review, I assume, is to get my opinion on things. So there it is. I don't think this Albion is worth the price. And that's going to wrap up this review. I want to give a huge thank you once again to my friend Brian for loaning me this sword. It is greatly appreciated, Brian. Thank you. For everybody else, make sure you hit the like button, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, do all the things YouTube wants you to do to let it know that you like this content and you want to see this channel continue to grow. Until next time, Alien 2 down.